Konnichiwa, Otakus. We're back with a new Witch Japan Man for you. Konnichiwa! Today we hang out at the Japanese Summer Festival. We interview Anatoly, one of the festival organisers, have some kakigori and celebrate the Japanese culture. And speaking of celebrating, if you want to celebrate in the middle of winter, Osaka Castle is where it's at. Ha! <laughs> Osaka Castle is one of Japan's most famous 16th century castles. It's also a massive canvas for the stunning 3D illumination displays during the Art Festival of Light, which is held every winter in Osaka. The festival stages light events across the entire city, which includes the Osaka Castle gardens and grounds. These are decorated with thousands of colourful illuminations and twinkling light tunnels to wander through on a chilly winter's evening. The 3D projections on the castle have to be seen to be believed. The images are projected onto the five-storey castle with 12 projectors. This year the castle was enveloped in flames, awash with gigantic waterfalls and bursting with emerging butterflies. The show finishing with the castle collapsing into the snow below. It is a stunning technical display full of beautiful illuminations and winter romance that will literally take your breath away. Wow, that was incredible. How beautiful were those light tunnels, Neko? Oh, so good, the snow. And speaking of Sugoi, we recently got to hang out at the Japanese Summer Festival in Melbourne. It was an awesome day. I think we nearly died of heat exhaustion, but there was plenty to see, plenty to do, and most importantly, plenty to eat. Let's check it out. <laughs> Hey everyone, it's Japan Demand and Neko here today at the Japanese Summer Festival and it's an absolute scorcher. We are absolutely melting, but you know what? It's totally worth it because it's such an awesome festival. So many cute little girls in kimonos and yukatas running around, awesome food, awesome dance moves and even some traditional jumping and a cosplay competition. Enjoy! Unreal, let's get back to it. So we're here today at the Japanese Summer Festival in Melbourne with Anatoly, one of the event organisers. Anatoly, thank you so much for your time today. Good to be here, thank you. <laughs> we're so happy you could give us an interview, that's just awesome. My pleasure. So, we'll go from the beginning. How did the festival start and who sort of supported it from the very beginning? Um, well, the first Japanese Summer Festival originated in 2010. It was an initiative of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry here in Melbourne and the Japanese Society of Melbourne and basically they were the prime supporter along with the Japanese Consul General here in Melbourne as well. Um, very small festival um, at Docklands, first held, and it's basically, it basically correlates with the um, Obon Festival in Japan, which is um, a traditional Japanese cultural festival that is when you give thanks to your ancestors who have passed. Ah. Yeah, so. Uh, that's awesome. It honors, so cool. it honors that tradition here. So it's more or less held in July or August in Japan but obviously here we do it in February. Oh, is that sort of to correlate with the season? The summer season, exactly. Uh, ding! Yeah. <laughs> now, um, the festival here over the years has um, grown in popularity. Um, would you say that's got to do with the fact that the Japanese culture has also increased in popularity? 
yes, and I think that we're, we're organising it better and better every yes. year too. <laughs> so, um, but I think that because the um, the Japanese community here in Melbourne is small compared to other ethnic groups, yes. but um, it is it is growing, and I think more and more simultaneously with the um, growing of the community as well as um, the fact that our festival is very word of mouth publicised yes, as well. I think they complement each other quite well and that's that's why we're so successful every year. Oh, that's Definitely. it, everyone working together to make this fantastic event, that's yeah. just yeah. awesome. <laughs> so we can see here you've used a lot of volunteers to help get this up and running. Where do you get your volunteers and how early do you start sort of training them I guess you could um, say? We put out the call to recruit volunteers in about September, if not October to November oh. of the previous year okay. beforehand. <laughs> yes, we're looking for you. Um, so generally around October, November, we have a couple meetings in December and January to prep them on what their roles are. We have about at least eight different teams where we group our volunteers into. So we have a media team, a guide team, a venue team that helps set up and pack up. Um, this year we've got a Bond dance team, which is um, going to help dance, you know, dancing and get, awesome. getting the public yeah. involved. And um, yeah, we've got some uh, like raffle team volunteers as well because we have a raffle going on. And um, yeah, we, we split them into those groups by January. We have them ready. And I think awesome. this year we've had over 100 volunteers, which, wow. is, which is a great that's success. Great. So thank you. It's a good turnout. <laughs> We're looking for 150 for next year. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> now, um, you know, a festival of this nature is you know quite large. Um, yes. What are some of the obstacles that you've encountered when putting it together? Mainly co coordinating everyone's schedules together. So. A lot of the setting up um, occurs from volunteer representatives of the Japanese Chamber's member companies. So we have a lot of um, volunteers from Toyota, Yakult, um, the Consul General sends a representative through as well. Um, and the volunteers who are just usually students, people with free time, Japanophiles, mm -hmm. all those people. Mm -hmm. So coordinating those schedules and trying to get everyone on board so we can give them the right information mm -hmm. on time, that's that's a real task because there's so many of us. Especially, yeah. yeah. So imagine that's probably one of the yeah, biggest difficulties. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and just making sure that we get everything right with our with our venues and yeah. things like that. So it's been a big jump from Docklands, which is more out of city than yeah. Fed Square, which is so central. So central. Yeah. yeah. That's it. So well, you'd be getting a lot of people just passing through and thinking, "Oh, what's going on over exactly. there?" And you come and check it out. Exactly. And all that kind of stuff. So. So we noticed you've introduced a cosplay section this year. Yes. Holla! That's awesome. <laughs> what are you planning on introducing in the future, or what have you introduced this year that's new besides cosplay? Uh, well, the first biggest sort of change we've had is the venue. So we've moved from <clears throat> Docklands to Federation Square. Another um, thing that we've sort of we've found, like we've found out during the planning is um, the City West Water water trailer, which in this heat. Thank goodness. Comes in handy. <laughs> it is yes. hot. It does come in handy. The cosplay, because we noticed that a lot of um, a lot of people came to Docklands last year dressed in, in costume. Cosplay, yes. And one of our um, volunteers from Honda um, said, why don't we have a best dress competition? And we all thought, oh wow, this would actually be something great. And it's more um, more for the public to get involved yeah, as like well. Interaction. We want it to be interactive as well. Um, Daiso, which has also recently opened in the year past. Everyone loves Daiso. We love yeah. Daiso. <laughs> yes. um, they've also jumped on board and they're doing um, origami and kirigami classes. So the cutting oh. up, so the kirigami is something new as well. Oh, awesome. I've got to so check good. out kirigami. Yeah. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'm thinking like for the future, um, you know, what, what are some of the other ways that you hope the festival um, will grow? Like what are you know, other ideas would you like to implement? Um, I think partnerships would be a good one if yes. we can join with another big festival. Um, it's, I'd certainly consider it um, that maybe if we could do something together with the Japanese Film Festival or oh, that'd be even, fantastic. If, we could, even yeah. if we could combine, um, I know there's a Japanese cultural festival that takes place in Box Hill, yes. um, you know if we could combine those or make an even bigger event or something like that, oh, that's definitely awesome. something to think about for the yeah. future. Something to look forward to, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's well, fantastic. Definitely. Well thank you so much for your time, it's been fantastic and I hope every future festival is a super success like this year has been. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Up next, we have Katie with Drop the Kawaii. Minasan, konnichiwa! Today we'll be looking deeper into the Kawaii lifestyle beyond fashion, including franchises. There are many different franchises in Japan that produce Kawaii goods, such as Dentsu, San X, Amuse, and the best known Sanrio. Being the most popular, Sanrio has the most famous of the characters, such as Batsmuru. Tuxedo Sam, Little Twin Stars, and the best, Hello Kitty. 
Sanex features one of the most popular of the Japanese characters, Rulakuma, and Korilakuma. Lastly is my favourite of the franchises, Densu, which produces Mamashiba. Even after a successful collection of ads, Densu became even more popular and successful when they collaborated with J-pop star Kari Pamu Pamu to produce Mamashi Pamu Pamu. The collaboration started with Mamashi Pamu Pamu plush collection and slippers. The collaboration worked on more than just plush toys. It also worked on band-aids, hairbrushes, keychains, pouches, and phone cases. The characters from franchises aren't the only ones that are made into plushes though. Even popular Nintendo characters get to become plush. Lovely. I hope you enjoyed this week's Drop in the Kawaii. Jana. Oh my god, how kawaii were Katie and Chelsea's outfits. Love me some drop dead clothing. So sweet, but so wrong. And next we have Steph with some game declassified. This week, by special request, she breaks down the legend of Zelda. <laughs> The Legend of Zelda series is a collection of well-loved role-playing, puzzle and action games, consisting of 17 official installments across Nintendo's major consoles and several spin-off titles. The Zelda universe is rich with characters and mythologies, which weave an intricate timeline and develop a multi-layered tale. In the mythology of the games, three deities known as the Golden Goddesses descended to create the Land of Hyrule. The goddesses left a sacred relic called the Triforce, which is the ultimate source of power in the Zelda universe. It consists of three golden triangles, each also called a Triforce, one of courage, one of wisdom and one of power. For the better part of the series, these Triforces are held by Link, Zelda and Ganon respectively. The protagonist of the series is Link, a young man who is humble and brave. These qualities make him suitable to be the holder of the Triforce of Courage. Zelda is the crown princess of the Kingdom of Hyrule, and she usually possesses the Triforce of Wisdom. And Ganon, one of the main antagonists of the series, usually holds the Triforce of Power. This grants him unimaginable strength and makes him a great threat to the Kingdom of Hyrule. As the series progresses and more games are released, the timeline of the games becomes increasingly complex. An official chronology of the series was released in a book that lays out the history of the Zelda universe based on the main games of the series. The most recent instalment in the Legend of Zelda series, A Link Between Worlds, is out now on Nintendo 3DS and adds to the rich history of the universe. This has been Steph with Game Declassified. Hey everyone, we're joined by Perry today at the Chaos Anime Secret HQ. Perry, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Japan the Man. No worries. So what new products do you have for us today? So, Japan the Man, yes. today I have Maidy Keiji. She's from Samurai Girls 2, Samurai Bride. She's a Hobby Japan Ultra Exclusive figure. They team up together to make exclusive figures. That's what they say, but they are exclusive, mainly only to Japan. Um, but we hunt them down and bring them here for you. We are Samurai Girl um, fans, so yeah, you're going to expect to see them here. She's awesome. As mm, you can see, the detail incredible. on it is absolutely amazing. I never thought Alter could keep stepping it up, but they have been stepping up. Some people out there might not like Alta, and because a few years ago they weren't that awesome, but their detail is just off the oh, book This is right amazing. Now. There's so much detail. It's yeah, just I love it's it. incredible. And like the Japanese inspiration behind it is... That's what I really love about figures in the house. Like, I love to collect all figures, but the ones I really go back to and have a look at mm -hmm. is this one. There's just so much. Oh, know, it's amazing. Like, from the saw to her umbrella, which is, you know, a big item. The umbrella you know, crazy. Her gown, and, you know, there's like a little pipe that's, you know, that's a hair bun in there. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. It's just amazing. So, yeah, fan service galore because that's pretty much what Samurai Girls is. And so, yeah, she's a great figure. Um, check her out. She's on our website. Perry, that first figure was crazy. What do we have here now? Yeah, that first figure was awesome. Right here we have, I'm pretty sure you know who we've got. Mm, yes. We've got Amy from Gargantia. Um, she's a Figma from Max Factory, good small company. Awesome. Um, we've taken her out of the box and so we can show you what comes in a Figma. So if you haven't seen, um, we've got, first of all, we've got Amy the figure and most people know she's pretty much articulated joints all over oh, her body. Oh, that's pretty cool. So yeah, you can twist her 
left and right there. Everything and moves, so, yeah. yeah, this one's a bit of, bit of an intricate stand with this one because of her glider. So with mm. this particular Figma, you won't get as much parts as most of the other ones because she comes with this massive, awesome glider. Yeah, so exactly. as you can see, she's pretty much got to be one of my favorite Figmas at the moment, just because look how awesome she is. Everybody that comes over and visits pretty much sees that straight away. <laughs> so yeah, uh, and what I've done now is taken out some parts out of, all the parts out of this Figma box. She only comes with a few parts. All Figmas come with a um, whole bunch of interchangeable hands so you can do different scenes or hold different things. Amy comes with her messenger bag from the anime. She also comes with two two heads. This one's a bit of a amused smiling face. Yep. And over here we have a bit of a disgruntled face. I think she gets a bit disgruntled with Leto over <laughs> Yeah. And here's a little... That's tiny. What's he called? What is he again? He would be a squirrel. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. And that's, a, that's Amy's little friend that, that you've seen in the anime. Yep. Um, yeah, so look, that, that's the Figma. That's our latest Figma that you can get from us. So that's why we're showing her because this is the latest thing. Oh. No, she's great. She looks really, really good. Yeah, she's pretty awesome. Like I said, the wingspans are huge. Yeah, and, it's a um, great glider. But yeah, once you put it together and put her in a pose, yeah, she just looks yeah. like she's just jumped off one of their ships. Definitely. Perry, that Gigantia Figma was unbelievable. What's this other Figma that we have here now? Well, what I've done here is I've pulled out Sayaka Miki, as we all know from Madoka Magica. Mm. Um, she's another Figma, but she's an old Figma that's not available anymore. Right. The reason I pulled her out is so I can show you. Do you know what happens to a Figma when they take steroids, Japan? <laughs> I don't know. Tell me. No, I'll show you, mate. Okay. So this is what happens to a Figma when it goes to the gym too much. <laughs> okay. Um, as you can see, the size difference of a Figma and a real action heroes is wow. what we're showing you here. Um, Last year at conventions, we had Mami Tomo Real Action Heroes, and everyone's like, what is that, what is that? So I'm going to give you a bit of a brief breakdown of a Real Action Heroes compared to a Figma. They're exactly, they're not exactly the same thing because they're different sides made by different companies, but they both are articulated. Now, so the difference between a Figma and the Real Action Heroes, as you can see, Japan the Man, mm -hmm. it's all material. Yeah. So her, her knee-high socks or whatever you would like to call them is material as oh, well. Yeah, it is too. So yeah, and her dress and like the so material, it's all fabric. It, exactly yeah. that. And so yeah, like I said, articulated like a Figma. You probably got a little bit more articulation than a Figma, so it okay. gives you a bit more poses. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I'll show you some what else they come with in parts wise. Okay, sure. So, so this is what comes in a real action hero. It's, like I said, a bit like a Figma it comes with all mm. interchangeable parts. There's heaps. Um, We've got two different faces. This one's a I'm going to attack you face. Yeah. And this one's a oh my god, oh, I'm so cute, cute face. So yeah. yeah. And she comes with an extra hair piece, which comes with a clip oh, that everybody will know there, of. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, just like a figma as well. They come with uh, extra hands different and stuff. Hands. So yeah, different I've only poses. got half of them at it. So there's probably another five hands to go. Wow. <clears throat> and all her swords. So all together, she's got nine swords. Wow. Um, so yeah, she's pretty damn awesome. I really like Saiyaka Miki. So Saiyaka Miki is probably one of my favorite characters in the show as you can see everything moves yeah and she stuff moves like heaps that. now we've got twist that way that way up down head round so yeah compared to a figma you probably get a bit more articulation out of him mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um yeah the good thing like um real action heroes like you can see they put like little touches like metal in the cape so you can make it look wavy oh yeah, yeah. so yeah um we haven't got a real action heroes page on our website yet but um, if you are after Real Action Heroes Madoka ones, get in contact with us because most of them have all sold out pre-orders. Um, we have Seika Miki, not Seika Miki, sorry, because she's already here. We have Kyoko coming, and then in April, the re-release of Madoka. Oh. So get on it before I open all the boxes, myself. <laughs> so, but yeah, that, that's it. That's the difference between uh, Real Action Heroes and... The Figma. The little Figma. Unreal, so before and after gym. Before and after, and if you really want to be a big collector, you get yourself an Android, a scale figure, and have no money left in your wallet. <laughs> Perry, thank you for spending some time with us once again and showing us your latest figures. Uh, thanks for having me, Japan the Man. No worries. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for our anime review, where this week we're taking a look at Gargantia on the Virtuous Planet.
So this is an awesome anime. I have to say, I really enjoyed it. Um, basically, it covers the story of a young soldier named Leto, who is originally fighting in outer space in his big mecha suit. For all the mecha boys out of there, it's got a bit of action in there for you as well. Um, he ends up being warped into this strange, mysterious planet by accident during battle. And basically, he learns how to be a human, which seems strange, but you've got to watch it to find out what I mean by that. So this mysterious planet that he finds himself on is entirely covered in water and he actually finds himself getting salvaged from underneath the water um, by the people of the planet. And along the way, he gets to meet, you know, like the crew of the, um, of the, of the ships which actually form the base called Gargantia. Yeah, it's very cool. They all live on their own individual ships that actually dock together to form almost a massive city mm, yeah. or something like that. It's a really cool concept. I found that very interesting. Mm. Um, it's also a very character-based anime, isn't it? Definitely. Like, the characters in it are, are definitely um, very, very strong. There's, like, you know, there's the, the cute female uh, sidekick called Amy. Amy, she's beautiful. All the boys love Amy. <laughs> Everyone loves Amy. Um, so Leto and Amy form a very tight friendship. Mm. It's a bit standoffish at the start, but, um, you know, they come together and they and you know and basically she teaches him you know how to be a human and yeah. you know why you can't do this and why you can't do that so it's, it's true he doesn't yeah. even know how to smile no. oh it's so cute yeah. <laughs> yeah she basically teaches him how to be a person and how to work with others instead of just being a i guess tool of war which mm. is what he sort of was before he came to this magical planet and and, and even how to eat you know like it doesn't yeah. know what it doesn't know like what chicken is or like what you know what, what, what different foods is. you're eating yeah. for pleasure instead of just eating for function you know what i mean so yeah. that's super awesome um, it also has an amazing sort of sci-fi aspect to it where it becomes this whole thing about humanity and developments and into space travel and sort of different planetary beings, which is yeah. very, very awesome. We don't want to ruin any of the surprises it, for you. <laughs> yeah, the, the good, no, definitely what, what you're saying there, like about, you know, I guess the underlying theme is generally about um, uh, acceptance, mm. you know, and accepting, I guess, you know, I guess, people for their differences yeah so which is which is good it's good that you know an anime has such a strong message throughout it Definitely. it's really good so for those of you that have seen Gargantia and liked it you'll be also pleased to know if you don't already that it's been approved for a second season yeah. which is mm -hmm. fantastic news I have to say I actually really really liked it and cannot wait for the second season I'm happily going to give this four out of five kendos awesome yeah i find it absolutely i just love the fact that they've approved a second season when i was watching it i thought it was actually going to go to 25 episodes because i thought they had more than enough sort of content to make mm. it to that but then it just sort of all wrapped up but in saying that it did wrap up in a very nice neat little yeah. package very complete solid season um i loved it as well i have to say i give it four kendos out of five as well and with that we've come to the end of season one of it's japan man but we're not done and dusted yet. We'll be having a few prize draws over the next coming weeks, so make sure you check the Japan Demand Facebook page for more details. Hmm, I think some of the giveaways might have something to do with the cosplays I've been wearing in the past couple of weeks. Yep, so just make sure that you go back and check them out. So to help you guys out, we thought we'd take you for a trip down memory lane with the past few episodes from this season. Hi, I'm Japan Demand, and welcome to the first episode of our new show. Hi, I'm Neko, and we'll be your hosts for our new show, It's Japan Man! Okay, let's make this easy. So we're here today with Brad, one of the main founding members of the Monster Hunter Get Togethers in Melbourne. Hi, I'm Katie Smart and this is my Otaku Life. Konnichiwa. Oh. <laughs> okay, so here we are at Neko Nation and the night's just started but already it's heating up inside. It's true, we're seeing some pretty funky characters already, a lot of cool outfits, some killer beats and it's just warming up. Oh my god, the girl that's DJing now, Katie Smile. Yes. She's so adorable, I just want to keep her. <laughs> this is Steph signing off for Game Declassified. Today we're going to be looking at the super duper 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 kawaii vivid red operation. Okay, okay. Fashion monster. First edition, Ninja Lee Bang Bang, Invader Invader, and Moto Nightmare. We're here today with Neil Creek, a Melbourne-based photographer who is well known for his cosplay photo shoots. Neil, thank you so much for your time today. And until next time, this is Steph with Games Are Classified. 
So we're here today with Perry from Chaos Anime to be showing us the latest figures that they have for sale on their website. Perry, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Japan Man. And we have our very first It's Japan Man giveaway. Giveaways! So we're here today with Lily, a singer from Brisbane. Lily, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks. This has been Steph with Game Declassified. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. It is awesome. Prepare yourselves, we are about to review the anime that was done. Anime of the Year by many a person, Attack on Titan. So here we are today with Perry from Chaos Anime in the studio. Perry, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Japan Man. Hi, this is Lily and you're watching It's Japan Man. Oh, Japan Man, so many memories. I know. We just hope that you've had as much fun watching it as we've had making it. We have absolutely loved getting all your feedback, guys. Emails, comments, everything. It's meant so much to us. All of it, the works. So don't forget, as usual, you can always reach us on our Facebook page, Google+, Twitter, and email. So until season two, I'm Japan Demand. And I'm Neko, signing off for the last time. Matane! Matane!